to direct. Okay, thank you, Michelle. So um, yeah, our topic today is um, cardiorenal metabolic disease, real world evidence and future directions. So our first speaker for today um, is Fiona Monday from the Eden team based here at the Leicester Diabetes Centre. So um, just to give some background, Fiona trained as a registered general nurse in the 1980s and then she switched from secondary to primary care in the 1990s. Um, she's held a practice nurse role ever since and proceeded to specialise in diabetes in the year 2000. Uh, she became involved in training and education shortly after that, um, initially starting with helping with education on the diabetes prevention studies here at the LDC and then subsequently proceeding to her role um, as education and research associate with Eden four years ago. So Fiona will be talking to us about a cluster of multiple long-term conditions in the form of the coexistence of cardio, renal and metabolic disease, um, including how they're interconnected, the implications of these links and the importance of keeping up to date, as well as taking a holistic approach to care. OK, I'll hand over to you now, um, Fiona. Well, thank you very much for that. And thanks, everyone, for joining. And, um wherever you are, even if you're on YouTube. <laughs> we appreciate you taking time out to listen to us, so thanks for that. So we're probably all involved in diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease and or long-term conditions, um, care or research in some way. And no matter what our role or occupation is, we've all probably realized by now that times are changing and that we need to continually update and then run to keep up. The last few years have arguably seen the greatest advance, advances in both treatments and guidance. It's been absolutely mind blowing. By now you'll have heard of CARE-ME probably, cardio, renal, metabolic, and that they are inextricably linked as Kamlesh likes to say. Um, but there's not just the three amigos to consider. One thing that's been dawning on us over the years is the interconnection between long-term conditions. The term multimorbidity is frequently used, especially in people living with diabetes. Incidentally, only about six or 7% of people living with diabetes just have diabetes. 77% of patients with type two diabetes have more than one comorbidity and all comorbidities are more prevalent in people with type 2 diabetes, especially older people and those most socially deprived. The most common comorbidities are myocardial infarction, heart failure and depression. And in addition to cardiovascular disease, osteoarthritis, hypothyroidism, anxiety, schizophrenia and respiratory conditions are highly prevalent comorbidities in people with type 2 diabetes. So this obviously can be difficult for clinicians, both to keep up to date and to ensure that patients are managed holistically, considering each associated condition during the consultation. Long gone are the days where diabetes care solely meant getting that HbA1c down. We now have to consider preventing and managing cardiovascular disease, renal and hepatic disease, as well as monitoring and managing blood pressure and lipids and reducing the risk of neuropathy, retinopathy, cognitive disorders and depression, erectile dysfunction, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All whilst working with our patients to think about their lifestyle, and giving appropriate encouragement and advice on diet, physical activity, smoking, weight management, alcohol, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So diabetes is a complex disease associated with multimorbidities, and it carries the risk of preventable, thankfully, complications. So how do you or your clinicians um, ensure that you're bang up to date in this ever-changing world? And how do you join the dots between diabetes and everything else? Well, Fiona, I think your oh, screen's not shared. I don't know if... Um... Okay, I'm going, I'll share the screen now. Um, let's go. 
I will. How's that? Okay, so this is um, a tool that I'd like to show you if you don't mind, um, that you can access easily. Um, just Google it. <laughs> All you have to do is type in your um, search engine, other search engines are available. Uh, Eden Elect. You can type it as all one word or two different words. Eden Elect. Uh, type that in and you will see a little green um, square that says go to body. And here is the body. We've, we've uh, been calling him the Eden body um, ever since we started to develop this about a year ago. Um, but he's, yeah, he hasn't got a name. You can call him what you want to, Frank or something. Uh, so here's Frank. <laughs> and it's a useful tool um, for anyone to use who's involved in diabetes, people with diabetes themselves who want to find out more. So you can tell your patients about it or the people on your trials um, or for clinicians during a consultation, it's quite helpful for them to have this to show patients whilst they're in consultation. Um, it was developed to be used on the big screen, not really on phones. Um, so it's better, it's better on a big screen. Um, but it's there to have quick, easy access to um, just about everything you need to know as, that's associated with diet diabetes and it's reliable information and it's quick to access. So I'm going to show you um, some examples just so that you can see how most things affect diabetes and diabetes affect most things. And it might it might be surprising for you. Um, it might not, but we'll we'll see. I'll I'll just click on a few body parts to show you how to use it and what's what's in there. So I'm going to start with Frank's liver. So just click on the liver. When you go into a body part, you'll get four bullet points. So these are four kind of quite essential things to know about a certain topic. So this one is the liver. So as you can read, diabetes is now the most common cause of liver disease. Virtually the whole spectrum of liver disease is seen in patients with type 2 diabetes, and it affects approximately 70% of people with type 2. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, known as NAFLD, is, uh, and its severe form, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, or NASH, um, are closely associated with type 2 obesity and insulin resistance. And one of the liver's functions is to monitor blood glucose. Patients with type two have a high prevalence of liver disease, and it's important to monitor their liver function closely, at least annual LFT blood tests. So again, it gives clinicians a little pointer that why we should be looking out um, for people's liver results when those blood tests come back and to a little prompt to discuss patients' livers with them <laughs> um, because it's somewhere where we don't, we're not always comfortable to go there if we're not experts in a certain field, but it's always worth a discussion with your patients. Um, so discuss liver function with your patients and try and detect NAFLD as early as possible. In some cases, liver disease can be stopped and even reversed. So there's good news there. Weight loss works. Losing 10% of body weight can halt NAFLD and NASH by reducing liver fat. So again, there's good news. It's not uh, the end of the world um, in all people. So very low calorie diets and metabolic surgery can help achieve this. Then if you want to learn more, you can click learn more and it will take you down to more information about NAFLD and NASH signs to look for what we can do about it and treatments. So that's the liver. Let me show you the kidneys. Seeing as we've got Courtney with us, I saw, I think. We'll have a look at the kidneys. So diabetes, kidney disease and cardiovascular disease closely linked with one affecting the other. So if we can protect the kidneys, 
we can protect the heart. And if we can manage diabetes as well, we can protect both. So early detection of kidney disease is crucial. The sooner we can start treatment, which is usually with ACE inhibitors or ARBs, blood pressure management and lifestyle changes, the better. And we can delay its onset and slow the progression of kidney disease. So also there's some good reassuring news. The best way to detect kidney disease, one of us, especially in primary care, is to look for um, urinary albumin to creatinine ratio. So always send in that uh, water sample, that really important water sample off. And a result over three milligrams per millimole is abnormal and requires action. Um, to classify the stages of kidney disease, look at the urine uh, albumin to creatinine ratio result combined with the EGFR, the estimated glomerular filtration rate. So just some clues there. If you go into main points, um, it will show you the function of the kidneys, the stages of kidney disease, what, what uh, stages go through, um, why kidney disease is a serious complication, uh, how to categorize um, kidney disease according to ACR and EGFR, and then how to calculate somebody's risk um, of cardiovascular disease according to those results. So again, some really useful information, what to do to slow the progression of kidney disease. Uh, you, there's links to the Kadigo, which is the diabetes um, guide, uh, improving global outcomes in kidney disease, which is an excellent resource. So there's a link there and there's also links to the NICE guidelines. What else should we look at? Let's just have a quick look at blood pressure because it's so important in people living with diabetes. So blood pressure then. Blood pressure care is vitally important for people living with diabetes. At least half of all heart attacks and strokes are associated with raised blood pressure. We know this. And it's a major risk factor for kidney disease, heart failure and dementia. Maintaining a healthy blood pressure is the most effective way of preventing cardiovascular and renal disease and will delay the onset of complications, including retinopathy and neuropathy, and it will improve all outcomes. So that's why it's so important in people with diabetes and in everyone. So try to maintain blood pressure in these limits. Uh, it suggests treatments of ACE inhibitors or ARBs in most people living with diabetes. If you want to learn more, more information as the NICE targets, the NICE guidelines of treatments and lifestyle advice for lowering blood pressure. And there's links to NICE guidelines as well, again, uh, for blood pressure treatment. I won't go on too long, but I'd just like to show you a couple more um, while I'm at it, just so you get the picture that every single part of the body is linked into metabolic disorder and, and uh, long-term conditions are connected to each other. So we'll look, if you click the left side of the brain, it goes to stroke. Stroke can occur as a result of damaged or blocked blood vessels. Uh, diabetes almost doubles the risk of stroke and mortality is higher um, and post-stroke outcomes poorer in people with high blood glucose levels. So the risk of stroke can be reduced by making healthier lifestyle choices, including blood pressure, glucose, cholesterol, weight loss, and healthier eating. So if we learn more about stroke, we can see that diabetes is a risk factor for stroke. It can cause pathological changes in the cerebral blood vessels, which increases risk, obviously. Uncontrolled blood glucose levels also increase the risk of mortality and post-stroke outcome. Um, so just a few facts or, and figures about diabetes and stroke, that 680 strokes in the UK every week are probably caused by diabetes or are related to diabetes. And these are preventable um, if people get the right 
advice and treatment early on. And if we go to the other side of the brain, another really important link with diabetes is, is mental health and dementia. Um, we've linked these two together, although obviously they're not the same thing. Three out of five people living with diabetes have emotional or psychological difficulties as a result of living with a long-term condition. You know, you've probably heard of diabetes distress, but all long-term conditions come with the same risk. People with diabetes have a 50 to 100% increased risk of, of developing depression. And people with diabetes have almost twice the risk of developing dementia. So ask your patient how they've been feeling lately. It's so important not to avoid that bit. I know I'm sometimes guilty of trying to skip past that bit because of time, but think, you know, if it's you, what would you want someone to be saying to you and how would you want that consultation to go? Would you like someone to ask you how you're feeling and how you're doing? So again, there's more information about the links between diabetes and there's some um, links for the um, health questionnaire PHQ-9 for, um, and, and the same for uh, dementia. Sorry, that was my dementia kicking in. So lastly on here, I'd just like to show you what's behind the doctor. So individualized care planning. This is a really nice part of the, of the body, I think, because it helps, helps us just think about how we conduct our consultation, how we speak to people with, with diabetes and long-term conditions. Um, remember your goals of care and um, that we're trying to prevent complications and optimize quality of life. Um, obviously taken from the ADA EASD guidelines of uh, the consensus report um, and adopt a patient centered approach uh, to enhance patient engagement in self care activities and ask your patient what they want to discuss what's important to them and then review your management plan with your patient once you've made it together. So it's important to break the ice with your patients, cultivate a shared decision-making relationship. It's really important to um, build a relationship together. You're, you're going to be working together for some time. And remember, it's their diabetes, not yours, or it's their long-term condition, not yours. As much as we like to help, um, patient self-management usually reaps better outcomes. So you're agreeing together on targets. And also, if you go to the more information in, in this section, um, you can access Diabetes UK information prescriptions, which are an excellent tool to use with your patient when setting targets. And if you scroll down, you'll see um, the new NICE guidelines for diabetes type 2, NG28. That's all in there. And you'll get down to the ADA EASD latest um, treatment pathway um, for hypoglycemia in, in adults with type 2. Um, so it's, it's all there. Um, for you to use Eden Elect, and I'll stop. I'll stop using him now. I'm just going to leave that on the screen um, to highlight, you know, how how things have changed in the last um, few years, really. And you know, as I said, we we are running to keep up, especially um, with medications, but also with guidelines. So. This was how uh, those guidelines looked originally when this first came out in 2018. And there's some massive changes between the original and this. The main one I have picked out is that if you look at the top of this, these guidelines, uh, the pathways going down, say if HbA1c is above target, then proceed as below. And then you go down to atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, heart failure, or kidney disease. 
on the new guidelines that have just came out um, at the very, very end of 2021, but are already being updated again, I hear today. Um, we're told to recommend independently of baseline HbA1c, and you can see it on there, atherosclerotic, people who are at high risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, heart failure or CKD, then follow those first three pathways, which mainly talk about SGLT2 inhibitors. So it's not about getting the HbA1c down. And diabetes care is no longer just about getting blood sugar levels down. Um, we're thinking about these medications, we're thinking about prevention of all long-term conditions and all complications, rather than treating them when they've occurred. And it's SGLT2 inhibitors that have started to link the specialities, they're linking uh, diabetes and heart failure, cardiology and renal um, specialities, they're bringing them all together. So diabetes, as we've seen from Frank, the man, the Eden elect man, uh, affects everything and everything affects diabetes. Medications, yeah, as, as we've said, um, are the, are the well, one of the massive changes, but it is the thing that's bringing, bringing specialities together. So in this session title, um, we, we were promised future directions. So how's the future looking? We think the future's bright. Um, certainly the future for people living with diabetes is far more promising than it ever has been. Who would have imagined 10 years ago that we would have a drug available to us that reduced cardiovascular risk, reduced blood pressure, slowed the progression of kidney disease, aided weight loss, helped people with, their, with heart failure feel better and lowered blood glucose. I, I certainly wouldn't. And not to mention diabetes remission. There's a term we hadn't heard of um, years ago. So there is a brighter future for people living with diabetes. And we're all excited about reducing the risk of complications and giving hope of longer life with fewer complications to everyone living with diabetes and enabling clinicians to stay up to date and informed is essential for this to happen. So thank you. I will stop sharing that and uh, just uh, say thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Fiona. Um, yeah, that was really, really useful to hear about um, the Eden elect as well. I think um, as we were talking before, it's great to have that kind of rounded information from all the various comorbidity aspects in one space, isn't it? And in such a user-friendly format. Yeah, I'll definitely be checking it out for sure. Thank you. So, um, so if anyone has any questions or comments for Fiona, please feel free to post them in the chat or to raise your hand. Okay, we've got something raised um, from Ashcon there, Ashcon, uh, regarding treatment for diabetes and CKD. So he's read that phenarin, I can't say, for, is, is approved in the US. Yes, it is. And I think it's approved in the UK now too. Um, so, you know, I, I do think, you know, as we said, for the future, Things are, um, when would it be approved in the UK? I'm not sure. Yeah, good question. I, I think it has been approved in the UK as well. So when it actually comes onto formula and when we can actually prescribe it is another matter. Um, I think possibly for any stage of kidney disease, um, it's not in the BNF yet, no, it's not. Um, but it has been approved by NICE, I'm pretty sure. So I think it will come. Um, these things do take a little bit 
longer, even, even if they've been approved, they don't appear straight away for us to prescribe, but um, it is coming. And I think, you know, I'm not saying that it's completely the answer. We don't know with a new drug, we don't know until we've, we've tried it and tried it on real people and seen what happens. Um, but it's great to have just some more um, tools in your toolkit, I guess, you know, more options available to our patients and, the, and certainly with people with progressive kidney disease or, or you know, progressing towards stage four or five, it's really good to have something else to try and um, we're looking forward to that. But uh, yeah, it's coming, but I can't say exactly when. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you. Yeah, as you say, we'll, we'll keep an eye out. <laughs> but uh, you say these things always seem to take take longer than they should, don't they? <laughs> okay, thank you. So, um, anyone else got any comments at all for Fiona or anything they'd like to raise? Once again, please feel free. Okay. So if, um, if everyone's happy, we'll move on to, to the next, next talk. Thank you very much, Fiona, for your time. That was really, that was really useful. Thank you. Um, so um, next today, um, our next speaker is um, Dr. Claire Gillies. So Claire is an Associate Professor in Medical Statistics uh, based at the Leicester Real World Evidence Unit. Um, she specialises in evidence synthesis, um, decision modelling, and the use of routinely collected data for health research. So today she'll be talking to us about real world evidence in the context of multiple long-term conditions. Um, thank you very much, Claire. So I'll hand over to you now. Thank you. Thanks, Haridi. Right, I'm just gonna share my screen and um, make sure it's up. Uh, right, so can you see that okay? Yes, we can, thank you. Yeah, lovely, great. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk about the use of uh, real-world data for research in individuals with multiple long-term conditions. Um, I'm going to sort of give a bit of background and then I'm going to talk through um, two analyses that we've carried out recently so you can sort of see how real-world evidence can be used in practice. Um, right, so just a little bit of background. Um, I mean, I'm probably preaching to the converted anyway, but... Um, there's uh, issues with uh, multiple long-term conditions increasing in uh, our population in the UK. Um, this is partly due to the population getting older as a whole, because we can see from uh, this plot that the older you get, the more likely you are to suffer from one or more long-term condition. Um, and you can see by the time that you're over 85, um, it looks like roughly only around 6% uh, of the population have no disorders. Um, so with an ageing population, we're, we're ending up with a high proportion of the population who have um, multiple long-term conditions. Um, and there's also issues around um, multiple long-term conditions um, increasing in the population as a whole. Um, over the, the last couple of decades. Um, so here we can see that um, in um, 2012 to compared to 2002, so a 10 year period, um, the number of individuals who have no long-term conditions has fallen while those with one or more has increased. Um, and this is partly due to the population getting older, um, but it's also due to um, the population getting more unhealthy as well. So uh, with an increase in sedentary behavior and obesity, um, which are linked to many long-term conditions, um, this has also led to the increase as well as the increasing age overall. Um, there's lots of implications of having an, a large proportion of individuals with multiple long-term conditions in the population. Um, Although Fiona sort of gave a talk where she very much um, talked about how uh, healthcare has changed uh, in recent years and the, the health of the individual as a, as a whole um, has got broader rather than just focusing on one condition at, at a time. We still do very much have a healthcare setup where 
um, conditions are treated separately. So an individual might go to one clinic to talk about their mental health and then visit the diabetes clinic separately and getting joined up care where, where medications are, are prescribed uh, with the, the whole patient in mind um, needs to be a focus going forwards and something we get better at. Um, so at the moment, care can be a little fragmented for people with multiple long-term conditions. They're at risk of polypharmacy where they end up on a number of different medications as all the conditions um, a sought to be treated separately, uh, increased risk of hospitalisation, um, reduced quality of life and increased um, mortality, risk of mortality and reduced life expectancy. Um, so with multimorbidity, um, so I'm going to switch between using the term multiple long-term conditions and multimorbidity because um, we used to always say multimorbidity is a team, but we've recently switched to multiple long-term conditions. So um, I'll use them a bit inter interchangeably. Um, but yes, with um, multimorbidity becoming an increasing problem worldwide, um, it's definitely an emerging priority in health research. Um, so I'm going to focus very much on how we've used uh, real world data to um, look at uh, pertinent research questions in people with multiple long term conditions. Um, so by real world data, what I mean is, um, so real world evidence um, is evidence based from real world, real world data. Um, and real world data is observational data obtained outside the context of interventional studies. Um, so where, as you might have a randomized or non-randomized controlled trial, or um, maybe a, a study, a, an observational study where you're um, comparing one group on, on an intervention compared to another group. Um, that's very much data collected within a study design. What I'm talking about in terms of real world data is data that's collected as part of routine care, um, usually. Um, so often it's not even collected um, for for, for, for research, for, for study. Um, it, it's data that's collected during reaching, reaching care, care, which we can then access um, and use for research. Um, so there's a number of different areas where real world data can be found. Um, so it might be collated as part of a, a sur surveillance um, a program that's um, being carried out. So for example, cancer registries in the UK and the National Diabetes Audit will all collect um, information that as well as being useful for planning healthcare, um, provides a source of information that would be useful for research. Um, it's also collected during routine care. So a lot of the data we use at the Real World Evidence Unit is collected on primary care databases, such as um, through CPRD. So if a GP practice is part of the, the CPRD um, a resource, then when you visit that GP, um, your records that are recorded on the system go into the CPRD cohort and um, this data can be applied for to carry out research questions. Um, it's really highly regulated. You know, you have to have a license to with CPRD, uh, you know, a signed agreement um, to access the data. And then for each study you want to carry out, you have to write a, a full protocol and ethics application. Um, and they're very strict on you following that um, and not sort of deviating from what you said you would do. Um, and that has to be approved internally by their committee. Um, so it's not freely available data, it's, it's taken care of very carefully because um, obviously if um, data is being collected on individuals in the population, that comes with a degree of trust and we should be um, making sure we, we use that data in a, an ethical manner. Um, as well as primary care databases, databases there's hospital episodes statistics, um, which will record events that happen in secondary care, um, and there's mortality data as collected by the Office of National Statistics. And if you apply for CPRD data, you can um, link your cohort to 
um, HES and ONS, so that you get um, a full timeline of an individual's um, healthcare and events. Um, so it allows you to explore um, lots of different um, outcomes for those, for those groups. And then in addition to these, there's also um, volunteering um, studies that collect data that can be used. Um, so the, probably the biggest one in the UK is UK Biobank, um, and that's one of the case studies I'll talk about. Um, and for this, it was um, a study that started in the early 2000s, and it was advertised and asking for people in the UK to join up. Um, and you regularly fill out surveys to give information on your health. Um, and then similar to CPRD, you, you write a protocol if you want to access UK Biobank, and then that goes through the system and it, and it is approved so that you can access the data. Um, so I'm going to talk through a couple of case studies because the probably the easiest way to explain how we use real world data for research questions is to give some examples. Um, and the first one I'm going to talk about was using a UK Biobank. Um, and this was work carried about out by uh, Yogini Chudasama, who was a PhD student in our department. So um, thanks to Yogini for the use of some of her slides for this. Um, and one of the, the pieces of work she did in UK Biobank was to um, look at the association between physical activity and all-cause mortality um, and life expectancy um, in people with and without multiple long-term conditions. Um, and there's a reference there if you want to look afterwards uh, to see more results from this work. Um, so a bit about UK Biobank. Um, it has over 500,000 participants, so it's a really large uh, data set. Um, baseline measures on the population um, were taken between 2006 and 2010, so that's when people joined the study. Um, a lot of information was collected on lifestyle factors, so things like diet, uh, whether they smoked or not, uh, drinking habits. Um, physical activity, um, but because physical activity, when you're trying to record it on a survey, can be really subjective, um, a subgroup were also given um, accelerometers um, to measure their physical activity over a short period of time. Um, but this was only carried out in 100,000 participants. It wasn't feasible to do it in the whole cohort. And obviously it was only done for a, a short period. It's not something that could be, do, be done continue, continually. Um, the UK Biobank data is also linked to mortality data. So we can look at um, death as an outcome within this cohort. Um, when Eugenie was, was carrying out this work, there was there seems to be lots of different ways of defining multiple long-term conditions within the population. So how do you decide who has multiple long-term conditions or not? I mean, the first thing you need to do is consider the, the chronic conditions you want to include in that definition. Um, so Yogini went down the path, path of defining it herself, and she did this by looking at the chronic conditions that are incorporated in the quality outcome framework uh, used by GPs. Um, she looked at a large systematic review and a large UK study, and uh, she took clinical advice on, on, on what she should be including as well. Um, and what she came down to was uh, 36 different conditions that she wanted to use in her definition, and uh, multiple long-term conditions was defined as having two or more of these 36 conditions. And you can see there, they're, they're all quite wide, wide ranging really. So we've got um, a lot of cardiovascular diseases as well as depression, eczema, um, epilepsy, glaucoma. Um, so yeah, a real range there. Um, and then defining physical activity. So she did do the analysis with the subjective measures where people were asked about their leisure, leisure time physical activity, which included things like um, gardening, walking for pleasure, going to the gym, um, and then their total physical activity, which took um, 
exercise outside of leisure time um, it included that as well. So whether they had a, a physically active uh, job um, and that type of thing. Um, and then there was also the objective measure, which was the wrist-worn um, accelerometer. Um, so an accelerometer is similar to a pedometer, um, but whereas a pedometer only uh, registers your step count, an accelerometer, it registers um, movement, so activity, but it also measures um, uh, um, your, your, your stature. So whether you're sat down, lying down, um, standing up, because um, obviously if you're standing and staying still, you're not taking any steps, but you're burning more energy than if you were just sat down or lying down. So uh, an accelerometer gives um, better physical activity data than a pedometer alone. Um, and using the accelerometer data, she grouped people into having uh, low physical activity, moderate or high physical activity in their daily life. Um, the data set she had to work on, uh, there was over 490,000 with complete data, um, but because only a small subgroup had had the, the accelerometer um, attached to them, there was just over 95,000 who had the objective data that she could use in the analysis. Um, medium follow-up was for around seven years, and during that follow-up time, there was over 11,000 deaths. Um, and the five most prevalent chronic conditions were hypertension, asthma, cancer, depression, and diabetes. Um, the, the key uh, object of the analysis was to compare um, the impact of physical activity in people with and without multiple long-term conditions. So we can, did consider how those two populations differ, differed within the cohort. Um, and unsurprisingly, really, people with multiple long-term conditions were generally older, they were more likely to live in a deprived area, more likely to be overweight or obese. Um, had a lower consumption of alcohol, and they spent more time sedentary. Um, so what she then did was that she fitted um, survival analysis models to look at um, risk of um, uh, mortality in people with multimorbidity, which is uh, this plot, and people without multimorbidity. And she was comparing the reference group, which was the people who had low physical activity with those who had moderate or high. Um, she fitted different models because she was adjusting for different variables, but um, if we concentrate on the results for model four, which is the same as these that are presented in the table, we can see that um, if you've got uh, moderate physical activity, um, your uh, hazard ratio for um, risk of uh, mortality, if you have multimorbidity, um, so it's re reduced roughly by 50%. So you're halving your risk of mortality if you're moderately physically active compared to if you have low physical activity. Um, and um, for people with um, high uh, Physical activity, you can see this is reduced further to um, a 70% reduction. Um, the results, so the analysis was stratified by, by people with multimorbidity and people without. Um, and you can see that uh, there was a similar effect of physical activity across the two groups. So moderate physical activity reduce your risk of mortality, um, whether you, you had multiple long-term conditions or not. Um, uh, with high physical activity performing slightly better than moderate. Um, and then as well as looking at risk of mortality, we looked at um, uh, life years gained in the two populations. So we have uh, people with multimorbidity on this side and people without multimorbidity on this side. Um, and this is showing you so we can see at age 45, um, the red line is comparing people who were moderately physically active to those who um, 
were had low physical activity. Um, and we can see at age 45, if you were moderately physically active, you could expect to live for three years longer than someone who had low physical activity. Um, I think the interesting things to see from these, these plots is that um, the life year gains, gained, so the increase in your life expectancy seemed to be uh, much better um, in people with multimorbidity than people without. Um, and also, um, for both plots really, there wasn't a lot to be gained with being highly physically active. You know, you gain an awful lot, so three years by being moderately physically active, and then you gain a few more months by being highly physically active. Um, so uh, I think that, that's good news for me. I don't have to work too hard at the gym, just, just moderately hard. Um, so yes, that, that produced some really interesting results for us. Um, in terms of the, the strengths and limitations of this work, um, I think having the, the accessibility to the objectively measured data was really helpful. Um, you can put a lot more confidence in the, the objective um, PA measurements compared to those that were recorded subjectively. Um, and obviously we had a really large data set to work with. If we were doing, if we wanted to carry out a cohort study where we looked at physical activity um, and effect on outcomes in people with multimorbidity, you know, we'd never be able to set one up from scratch with 95,000 people. Um, I mean, the cost would just be huge. So having access to uh, these sort of data sets is really helpful and provides large data sets for research questions. Um, limitations, you're limited, limited by the data that's collected and the timing of the data collection. So um, the physical activity data was uh, recorded um, you know, if follow-up is for seven years and it's recorded at the start of the, that period, by the time an individual dies, um, their physical activity might have changed an awful lot. Um, also, you, you, you've only got a short window that you were measuring the physical activity in. And, you know, if I was wearing an accelerometer that I knew someone was going to be looking at the results, I'd, I'd probably be walking every day and, and trying to get out there and run and show that I was being healthy. So um, yeah, there are sort of limitations in that, the data we had. Um, I think one of the, the major limitations which we discussed in the paper was the possibility of having reverse causality in our data. So it was difficult for us to say that physical activity was increasing the life expectancy of the individuals because it could just be that people um, who were more physically active were generally the, the healthier individuals. Even those who had multiple long-term conditions, you'd expect that those who were more physically active uh, were likely to be healthier. And that's why they were being physically active, not the other way around, that the physical activity was affecting their health. Um, um, so that's the first study. The second one I'm going to talk about was using ISARIC data. Um, and I particularly want to talk about this one because I think it highlights the use of real world evidence to help with um, um, health crises. So where you, you need data quickly um, and you, you've got urgent research questions that you need to address. Um, and obviously the, the COVID-19 pandemic is probably the, the largest example, most important example of this we, we've ever had in, in our research history. You know, we had this huge pandemic and people wanted answers really quickly about what was happening. Um, so for this one, we're using something called the ISARIC data, which I'll tell you a bit about. But we wanted to look at the impact of cardiometabolic multimorbidity and ethnicity on cardiovascular and renal complications in patients with COVID-19. Um, and the reference is there if anyone wants to have a look at the study in more detail. Um, and thanks to Tom Norris for uh, this work, because he carried out the analyses for this. Um, <clears throat> So the ISARIC resource, so um, ISARIC stands for the International Severe Acute Respiratory and e Emerging Infections Consortium. Um, and this was um, 
The protocol for this group was developed in 2009 with um, collaboration from WHO. And what they wanted to do was to put together a federation of clinical research networks that would be able to provide coordinated and uh, an agile research response um, to uh, new and emerging infections, infectious diseases. So this was already in place before COVID-19 happened. There was an awareness that the, the, there was likely to be situations where we needed health research data quickly. Um, and there was a protocol in place for how this would be collected. Um, there's a website there that you can have a look at um, and it shows, um, it has lots of resources on there for health researchers. Um, this page in particular within that ISARIC website, website is focused on COVID-19 and it talks about the uh, affiliated studies with ISARIC, um, how the data is collected, clinical data that's available um, and research protocols. So there's a lot of information on there for researchers. Um, so what we did was, um, when we're looking at what research we wanted to do around the COVID-19 pandemic, um, we found the, the ISARIC resource became available, and this was covering any patient who'd been hospitalised with COVID-19. Um, so there's different data sets that looked at different things. The ONS data had uh, the surveillance data, which was more looking at people who had suffered COVID-19 um, in the whole population and following them up and, and tracking their symptoms and also looking at a uh, number of cases and how that was changing over time. The ISARIC was very much focused on um, adults that have been hospitalised with COVID-19. Um, so we applied for access to the data and then this is all done through a trusted research environment. So you log in, once you've been approved with your study, you log in and the data's there for you to um, manage and analyze. Um, when we accessed the data, uh, which was probably about April, May time in 2021, there was 302 UK healthcare facilities that were part of the data set and were providing um, patient information to the data set. Um, and it included adults hospitalised by COVID-19 up to uh, the 16th of March 2021. Um, there was uh, over 65,500 patients and over 44,000 of these um, had at least one cardiometabolic uh, condition on admission. So you can already see that the, the people who were being hospitalised with COVID-19 were um, already those of poor health. You know, most, yeah, two thirds of them had at least one existing cardiometabolic con condition. Um, and what we wanted to do was to look at outcomes of this group by ethnicity, cardiometabolic condition, uh, um, so type of condition and also number of conditions. So whether they had zero, one, two, or more than two conditions. Um, and the outcomes we were looking at were um, mortality and then other cardiovascular complications and renal injury. Um, I'm going to talk you through this graph because I'm afraid I took it straight from a paper. So I realised that the axis is a little bit small. But you can see that uh, this is the odds ratio of um, having a further cardiovascular or renal complication whilst you're in hospital or um, your um, risk of death. And then we're comparing um, people who had no cardiometabolic comorbidity with those who had any. So this group is everyone else, whether you had one, two, three, four, five, or six or more cardiometabolic conditions. Um, this is people who just had one cardiometabolic comorbidity compared to those who had none. This is people who had two compared to those who had none. And this is people who had three or more compared to those who had none. Um, so you can see that your risk of having a, a further complication, uh, cardiovascular or renal, um, is so it's statistically significantly different um, 
for each of these, for anyone with a cardiometabolic comorbidity compared to those without, because um, you can see this is one which would show you no difference between the reference group of no comorbidity. Um, and you've also got a really nice trend there in that, well, not nice, nice is probably the wrong way to, to describe it, but um, yeah, it's a strong trend in that you can see that the more um, cardiometabolic comorbidities you have, the um, increase in your, the risk, your risk is increasing of having a, a complication. Um, and you've got a similar pattern with mortality, although the odds ratios are slightly, slightly smaller, but they're still all statistically significant. So having um, a cardiometabolic comorbidity significantly increase your risk of mortality compared to those who had none if you were hospitalised with COVID-19. Um, and these are the same graphs, but instead of um, combining all um, further complications, we've separated them out. So we've got um, arrhythmia here, ischemia, cardiac arrest, um, coagulation complications, and then along the bottom, we've got stroke, heart failure, and renal injury. And um, probably the one I want to pull out the most is, is heart failure. Because you can see this y-axis, the odds ratio goes up to 12, which is um, a, huge, um, a huge increase in the odds of um, having this event if you have a, a cardiometabolic comorbidity. Um, at baseline. Uh, so yes, there's a really strong uh, association there. Um, and conclusions from what the work were that in hospitalized patients with COVID-19, cardiovascular complications or death impacts just under half of all patients um, with the highest risk in those of South Asian or Black ethnicity. I didn't show you the ethnicity results, but I think it's, it's interesting to consider that. Um, and in patients with cardiometabolic multimorbidity. Um, so that, that's sort of two examples of where we've used real world evidence to, to answer research questions in multiple long-term conditions. I think the use of real world evidence is really important going forwards for, for all areas of, of health research. Um, there's, there's lots of benefits and a few limitations as well, but um, benefits are that it can be used to react quickly to health crises, you know, trying to set up um, cohort or observational studies um, from scratch without access to real world uh, data that's being collected uh, routinely. Uh, it would be time consuming and costly. And um, you can see with the ISARIC data, there was already a protocol in place to make sure that data came through really quickly for researchers to act on. Um, there's other benefits of real world evidence. So we collaborate a lot with um, pharmaceutical companies. So um, as Fiona was talking about um, new uh, medications that have been approved in diabetes uh, within a, um, when they're going through the approvals process, they're um, tested in very strict uh, randomized control trials um, and it's not really until they're applied in um, the real world that you get a, a full view of, of how they perform. Um, randomized control trials can be really restrictive on the patients they include so um, individuals with multiple long-term conditions are likely to be excluded from a lot of clinical trials you know if they're trying a new diabetes drug um, they might just want those individuals who have diabetes, they don't want those who are, are already quite poorly with other complications. Um, so by looking at how new drugs perform in the real world in practice, it gives them a really good overview of what's happening. And we work a lot with pharmaceutical companies to just do that. They, they will ask us to use primary care data and HES data to see what's happening in the real world. Um, because there's so much data as well, it allows you to look at a broader range of confounders and you often have a much longer follow-up and large sample size than if you're trying to set up a cohort study from scratch. Um, limitations are that you can't influence the data that's collected. So if you were setting up a study yourself, you'd know very much what outcomes you wanted to include and what patient data. 
but you know we we have the data that's given us um which can be quite limited um so for example with the isaric data it was people who entered <clears throat> At the point of hospitalisation, um, and these weren't um, always linked back to primary care records. So we had the information that was recorded um, at entry to the hospital, uh, and we're missing a lot of the background of those patients. So if we wanted, um, I don't know, maybe information on when their diabetes had been um, um, identified then uh, that might not be information we have it, it, you just have the, the data that's presented for you um, because the data sets are often really large then I think having experience of managing the data sets is really helpful and it's something we're still still learning as a unit to how to work with these large data sets um, and it's also computationally intensive. So if you ever visit us in the Leicester Real World Evidence Unit in our offices, where we're, our main office is the only two offices are the only two that have air conditioning in the diabetes center. And that's because we've all got big computers to try and, and do this work and work with the data. So um, there are pluses to being part of our team if anyone wants to join when it gets hot in the summer. Um, but yeah, so that's a bit of an overview. So I'll, I'll stop now. So thanks. Thank you very much, Claire. No, thank you. Um, that, that was really, was really useful, really thorough and actually really broke it down really nicely for um, to kind of for somebody like, certainly for somebody like me um, with, you know, it's quite new to understanding real world evidence. And it's really nice to understand the benefits and the pitfalls and also actually some of the processes around um, how you'd actually go about using real world data as part of research. I found that really useful, so thank you. Um, so um, yeah, as before, so um, we've actually, we've got a question already from Ashcon, so um, so it's just in the chat here. So he's asking, with regards to the first study on multimorbidity, physical activity and mortality, where can founders such as quality of diet taken into consideration? Yes, so we definitely looked at, at, at diet. Um, I'm trying to remember what information we had. But yeah, a lot of confounders were adjusted for. So where I showed you the graphs, there was four different models. And I think we had the unadjusted result. Then we um, adjusted for lifestyle factors. And then we adjusted for um, other considerations, such as um, age, um, gender, ethnicity. Um, so the fourth model was the, the fully adjusted model where we try to account for uh, any potential confounders. Uh, but diet was definitely in there because that was something important to consider. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. I think Shukra, you've got your hand raised. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Claire, for the presentation. Um, I was wondering about um, anonymizing data. Um, you know, when it comes to linking data sets, it means that um, the primary data set wouldn't be anonymized completely or will be pseudonymized to be able to link to maybe primary care data. Do you understand what I'm saying? So yeah. I'm just wondering at what point um, do data users, you know, on the user end get access to the data and how yeah. Do you deal with issues of anonymization of data? Yeah, so it's it's an important question. And um, when you apply to access um, to CPRD, they want to know what you're linking to because they want to make sure you're not going to be able to identify patients by what you're linking with. Um, we usually only ever link to HES and ONS. Um, and CPRD um, help with that. So what we would do would be to download our cohort from CPRD that we're interested in. We'd have a list of CPRD patient IDs. We send those IDs to CPRD and then they send us the HES and the ONS data with that, with that patient link, which is what they've created. Um, so, Okay. Yeah, and because you have to justify all the data you're collecting um, and each of the data sets are anonymized, there shouldn't be any risk there of being identified, being able to identify patients. Okay, so in effect, you only get what you need. It's yeah. not like, you. okay, okay, yes. thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you. Uh, any additional questions from anyone? We did have a question earlier on, actually just, just at the start of your talk, Claire, from Margaret, Margaret Milne about, um, I believe about Fiona's talk, um, I think where she's asked, uh, what are your thoughts on the fact that in Parkinson's, the diabetes is due to mitochondria and these patients require different drugs? I think this is um, yeah, I'll do my best <laughs> on this one. Um, just in case anybody wants to know mitochondria are in in every cell in the body they're they're all over the place and they're responsible for providing energy really for the body um i think for most of us the mitochondria mitochondria produce about 90 percent of energy for our bodies um and and that's what our bodies need to function so um I think in Parkinson's saying that diabetes is solely due to the mitochondrial dysfunction. It, it, yes, it's related to that. And you can see why diabetes would be related to something that produces energy or doesn't produce energy if there's a dysfunction with it. Um, but people with diabetes who also have Parkinson's um, will also have other contributing risk factors that has um, made them present um, at some stage with type 2 diabetes. So um, I'm assuming we're talking about type 2 diabetes. Um, so there are other things that we can use to treat people with Parkinson's and diabetes. Um, and it will still work. Um, there's an interesting, there's a lot of research going on with incretin hormones in people with Parkinson's. So that they what drugs that we call GLP-1s, which are um, a godsend to us to use for people in, in diabetes. Um, GLP-1 is glucagon-like peptide. It's a it's a an incretin hormone, and and it's very successful at helping people lose weight, and it's very successful at preventing atherosclerotic disease in particular. So people at high risk of we think of stroke. If people have type two diabetes, we would choose one of those drugs. Now the the research. Um, is still ongoing, but it's looking quite promising that it will be an effective treatment for Parkinson's as well. Um, and GIP, which is um, also just coming into being as a diabetes treatment. GIP is, what does that stand for? Gastric inhibitory polypeptide. I'm looking at James. I think that's what it is. Um, so so things are looking promising um, in that area. Maybe th there's another overlap here with a treatment for diabetes that is also going to be effective for another long-term condition. Um, I, I've not read yet any research papers that have concluded that, yes, this is going to work, use it. But um, it's looking good in animals and in the studies on humans that have been done so far. I think it it's it's possible. So um, they are my thoughts. I don't know if that was any help at all. Um, I've not got many thoughts, but uh, yeah, that's about it. I hope that was helpful, Margaret. Thanks, Fiona. Thank you. Um, so um, we've got a couple more, a um, couple more questions there. So one from um, Amrit Van Stola there. So are there any upcoming studies that you're aware of about physical activity and um, multiple long term conditions? Um, not that I know of. We're still doing a lot of work ourselves in multiple long term conditions, but we've sort of um, shifted the focus a little bit. So um, we've got a few studies coming up, coming up where we're looking at um, well, Shukrat, who's here, her PhD is looking at uh, disruption in care during the pandemic. So comparing um, care and outcomes before and after the pandemic in people with multiple long-term conditions. 
Um, and then uh, we've got some work um, around um, people who were hospitalised with COVID-19 um, and uh, looking at what happens afterwards. So whether they're, they're readmitted to hospital um, or not, uh, or if they leave hospital and, and go on to die. And we'll be linking that to multiple long-term conditions as well. Um, but yes, I think um, Tom Yates might be the best person to ask about future studies in the centre around multi morbidity and activity. Um, but our group at the Leicester Real World Evidence Unit doesn't have any plans. Thank you, Claire. We've got a question from, um, from Ashcon there as well. Um, so on the topic of GL, uh, GLP-1 agonists, I think this will be for Fiona. Um, I read that his appetite has, um, has demonstrated substantial weight loss in the trial. Do you know if there are plans for it to be approved in the UK? And um, in, it was for treatment of obesity, he says to clarify. Yeah, that. yeah. So this is so exciting. This is this is a GLP-1 receptor agonist and a GIP combined. Um, and I'm sure it will be approved in the UK. Um, Praying for the day, yeah. The out study outcomes have been phenomenal, really, with um, greater weight loss than GLP-1 alone, and they the two seem to be looking like they will work together really well, and that the GIP ingredient James has just handed me a note which stands for glucose dependent insulinotropic polypeptide. <laughs> He's, he's my little assistant there, he's just dropped that in. Um, he, yeah, it, it, the GIP hopefully will go some way to relieving some of the nasty side effects of GLP-1, which is mainly nausea and gastrointestinal disturbances. So we hope that combined, this is gonna be really effective and, and the weight loss is much better than um, GLP-1 alone. So. It's, I'm sure it will be approved. And um, again, it's waiting for, for that to, to happen and to come on formula a bit. Um, buy shares in Lily while you can. Okay. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Fiona. And um, we've got a question for Claire now from, um, from Zara Kayani. Um, so, um, she'd like to know about the ethnic breakdown in the multimorbidity and PA study, uh, which ethnic groups and subgroups have any were included, and any info regarding percentage of ethnic groups included. Yeah, so um, I was just trying to get it back up actually to see see what the results were. Um, ethnicity is always difficult because um, it's often not very well recorded, particularly, you know, you can imagine if a patient's coming into hospital, their, mm. their ethnicity isn't really anything the, 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 the staff are that interested in, you know, they want to know about current comorbidities and um, current health, um, but ethnicity is, is often not recorded. But we did have information um, broadly on ethnic group, and that was um, white, um, black, um, South Asian or other, I think is how we, we classified them. Um, and uh, Probably anyone who's who's kept up with the COVID nineteen research will know that um, the the black and the South Asian groups um, did worse than um, the whites in terms of um, outcomes um, in those hospitalised with COVID nineteen. Um, so I think I'm just wondering: Have I answered the whole question? I'm trying to find it now. Um, percent of ethnic groups included. So yeah, I think it probably would have been about 85% white. Um, although, uh, yeah, with a hospitalised cohort, I think the the uh, minority ethnic groups were probably higher than what's representative for a UK population. But yes, I can't remember off the top of my head. I'll, I'll um, look it up. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Um, so we've got a comment from Margaret as well, um, saying as there is no treatment as such for Parkinson's, when we were talking about Parkinson's earlier on, uh, there are many studies with exercise and Parkinson's which are proven to be successful. And Judy Jones, Professor Baz Bloom and Petzinger in America are just a few. Thank you. Thanks, Margaret. 
Yeah, it's a, clearly a rapidly an evolving area that we should we should keep an eye up, an eye out for definitely. Um, and we've got another a, a question from Shukra as well. So, um, thinking about personalised care approaches, is there any benefit or evidence for using treatments in types of diabetes and um, metformin GLP one agonists for type one diabetes patients with some insulin resistance rather than insulin only treatments in type one diabetes? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so, yes, is a tentative answer, but but with caution so obviously as um you go into kind of a, a, a progression of disease you can get traits of type 2 disease in people with type 1 um, associated with insulin resistance um metformin is used um in people with type 1 on occasions by and started by uh, consultants mainly in the clinic. I personally, as a practice nurse, wouldn't add anything like that um, to someone who has type 1. I would just purely stick to insulin because that's what's um, missing. And be mindful that the pathophysiology between type 1 and type 2 is very different and the way the medications work um, I, I'm not comfortable to prescribe something for someone with type 1 that was intended for type 2. So that's the simple answer in, in practice. But I do know that uh, consultants in, um, in clinic do occasionally do that. GLP-1, I wouldn't be so sure about, but I, I know that people have met, used metformin in the past. Uh, there was an SGLT2 called uh, dapagliflozin that was licensed for a while um, to be used in type 1 for this kind of um, problem. That license has been withdrawn, so at the moment it's no longer licensed. Um, and I think the reason was that they didn't have enough evidence yet that that was safe and beneficial. And so it's, it's withdrawn. We can't prescribe that. Anybody can't um, in type one. It's just for type two uh, whilst we gather more or they gather more evidence. So I guess, yes, with caution and, um, you know, occasionally types of diabetes do merge together a little bit. And there is a bit of an overlap. Um, as people with type one can gain weight over time. Um, so does that answer your question? <laughs> um, I, I think, uh, you know, in, in, in normal practice, unless you're a specialist or consultant, then I wouldn't go there, but uh, refer if you're kind of suspicious or think, would, would this help? Um, refer to me. Thank you. Thanks very much, Fiona. Thank you very much, Claire. So um, anyone else that has any questions, please feel free, feel free as you have been doing to post them in the chat or to raise your hand. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, um, Fiona and Claire. They were really useful, really, really interesting presentations, really thorough, and I've certainly learned a lot. So thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Um, so now, um, so for the for the kind of last last bit really of the whole series, um, we just wanted to just um have a bit of an interactive element, I suppose, where we, um, as a, there's only 16 of us now, so a small group of us, um, to have a think about a few um, a few things in, in, in particular, kind of thinking back to multiple long-term conditions, um, thinking about future directions from an education perspective, from a research perspective. Um, and we've got a way in which, so I don't know if everybody's familiar with Jamboard. So um, I'm just gonna post the link on the chat. So this is like, a this is a virtual um, whiteboard really. So where we can, um, you know, record our record our thoughts on post-it notes and sort of put them all together um, and create something like a spider diagram or brainstorm. Um, so I have made one um, and I'll share my screen as well. So um, what, what I was hoping for, obviously it's more difficult in a virtual format than in real life, but I thought it'd be really nice to, because um, we've got such a diverse group of people attending and particularly for people who've um, been able to attend the previous sessions as well, to gather some thoughts um, on, on these on future directions 
um, and kind of record them you know on this whiteboard so that we've got something to take away from this session um, and for, for future series that we organize as well. So I think the way Jamboard works is like I say I'll share my screen and if um, for each of the topics um, for any points that anybody would like to contribute or to raise or anything that they'd like to let me to put on a sticky note and um, you can post it on the chat or raise your hand or just just speak because there's any small group of us so um, feel free to just just um, just you know to um, to unmute and, and speak um, or if you'd like to add to the Jamboard yourself, I think you can actually do that as well by just clicking on the link. You don't have to be a member or have an account or anything. You should just be able to open it up yourself and add a sticky note yourself. Okay, so I hope that explains it. So I'm going to try and um, share it now. Um, so just bear with me one moment. So I'm just going to share my screen there. Sorry, it does say I can only view it only. I've clicked on the link, so I don't know whether you can check to give people edit, editable. Um. Um, yeah, so I think, oh, is that what it says, is it? It says uh, view well, it only at the moment. Yeah, it says view only. I mean, maybe for afterwards, if people want to add anything, you could change it then, but... Um, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. I mean, I think uh, perhaps maybe the easiest thing then is, um, because I can see the Zoom chat here as well, so um, perhaps the easiest thing is if I, is if, can everybody see my Jamboard there, the one I've raised here? Yes. Yeah, you can yeah. see that. So perhaps then if everybody would, um, you know, kind of wants to um, raise their points on the ch Zoom chat or just um, raise your hand or just on mute and just, you know, just um, um, and speak and I'll add that as a sticky note to the Jamboard so that I keep it in one place. Yeah. Um, okay, so first of all, um, so um, seeing as this has been really the aim of this series was to kind of look at um, from an educational perspective really in multiple long-term conditions and sort of bridge that gap between research and clinical practice with an educational focus, um, a peer-led educational focus. Um, so um, first of all I think it'd be good to think about future directions, um, so this can be things like what's, um, what, what's worked so far as part of this education, educational series, what would be good to have in the future, um, what topics are particularly pertinent and need more attention or need you know, need um, more educational sessions on. Um, I've started off here um, by from as a, I'm, I'm a GP by background, and so from a clinician, clinician's perspective, or particularly a GP's perspective, so managing polypharmacy and optimizing treatment to minimize burden um, in managing patients with multiple long-term conditions. And um, I think that's a really important educational um, area, really, that um, I'd like to work on in the future. So, um, has anybody else got any thoughts on this topic? So you think about education for um, clinicians and patients or for researchers like us, uh, as in... Yeah, I think it can be from different perspectives really and I think that's been the really nice thing about this particular series because we've had clinicians, we've had patients and we've had researchers as well involved and I think it's really nice to consider it from a holistic perspective, isn't it? From so um, yeah, so from any perspective, really, for all of us who are involved in either kind of managing multiple long-term conditions, doing research in this field, or living with multiple long-term conditions, what's important from an education perspective, and what's what are important future directions? Um, well, I think coming off the um, topic a little bit of your yellow stick, you know, I think from where we're thinking about it is better understanding um, what is happening in terms of self-management for multimorbidity, thinking about then going on to develop sort of interventions, thinking about the patient more holistically than rather than the historical, you know, disease, single disease centric focus. So I had to summarize that, I don't know yet, just to better understand what is happening in terms of um, yeah, absolutely. Self-management and um, and kind of an, a holistic perspective, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's been, um, I mean, that's been something that we focused on and during this series as well. Yeah, on um, so, um, and yeah, I think that's a really important. You know, really, I mean, in my view, I think that sort of that holistic approach is 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 the key in tackling the complexity of multiple long term conditions mm. and, and taking that patient centered element. And then um, from Ellen's um, Ellen's um, 
talk um, a couple of weeks ago and um, was really exciting to think about future directions in this, yeah yeah from a self-management perspective absolutely so yeah that's great thank you Fionn okay we've got something in the chat now as well okay so um, Ashcon says there should be greater emphasis on the prevention of multiple long-term conditions where possible um, more emphasis to include patients in their care particularly uh, with highlighting the role of exercise and diet physical inactivity um, and poor quality diet are linked with hypertension, ob obesity, diabetes, depression, and many of the comorbidities in poor quality of life. Um, absolutely, Ashcon. So, so am I right in thinking this is from a, so from a patient education perspective, um, in any kind of enabling patients to, um, to engage again with some, some elements such as um, kind of promoting physical activity, um, diet, lifestyle changes, yeah, and, and uh, you know, to and I, I suppose as a clinician, kind of educating clinicians as well, and managing multiple long-term conditions to consider these um, the kind of biopsychosocial elements rather than purely the clinical elements, isn't it? So um, I think that sort of links to holistic care, isn't it? But I'm going to summarise that. I'm going to pop that on the sticky note here. So um, correct me if I'm wrong, Ash Ashcon, but um, so education on prevention. Going to summarize that as okay, feel free to feel free to correct me if there's anything you'd like me to change maybe lifestyle education would be yeah, yeah. yeah that summarizes it nicely thanks claire so lifestyle education um, So, okay. Um, also to uh, say as well, I have changed the um, the setting on the uh, the Jamboard to make it um, for anybody with the uh, with the link to be able to edit it. So you should now be able to edit it if you click on it. So if you, if you'd like to, I mean, feel free to just post in the chat, and this is working nicely. But if you'd rather post on the board itself, then that option is also there. Okay, so um, we've got Courtney there, Courtney saying, um, so following on from Ashcon's comment, patient activation, um, giving people knowledge, skills and confidence to take a more active role in their health health and healthcare, isn't it? Absolutely, so, um, so what I'll do then, perhaps I'll edit patients. So clinicians in considering um, biopsychosocial elements. I suppose empowering patients, isn't it? Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. So I'm um, sure um, has raised the point of trialing approaches to integrating healthcare services um, in patients with multiple long-term conditions in primary care. Um, absolutely, yeah. So um, yeah, so it's sort of preventing that fragmentation of care. Am I, am I right in thinking, Shukrat, that of coordinating the various kind of health, yes. yeah. Absolutely. So we've actually got so um, this is our future directions for education board. But then so next we do have a future directions for research board as well. So actually maybe um, where that should go. Yeah. yeah, I think that should be there. So yeah, I'll pop that on there for now, and then we, when we come to the research board, we can think a bit more about there as well. So uh, integrating. Great, thank you. Great, so I'll, I'll come back to the educational board and then we can, um, so from for Margaret, we've got, um, yeah, education, a master who declared that Parkinson's is the fastest growing neurological disease in the world, integration would be great. Yeah, 
Yeah, thank you very much, Margaret. So, um, yeah, absolutely. So can, taking that sort of integrated approach, um, you know, across across kind of clusters of multimorbidity, I suppose, am I right in, you know, considering um, kind of like we said with the other, with the other points, rather than thinking of things from a single disease perspective to kind of to integrate things and consider from across multiple long-term conditions, including including Parkinson's, but also the kind of, I suppose, the wide reaching impact um, of kind of individual chronic conditions that, you know, how they can interplay with other conditions, bearing that in mind as well. So with Parkinson's, we were talking about diabetes earlier on, weren't we? Um, so, so interplay, so um, something like interplay. Okay, so that's I've captured that there, but um, feel free to correct me, Margaret, if you'd like me to change it or if there's anything else that you'd like me to pop on there. Okay, so um, health literacy considerations. Yeah, absolutely. So that ties in um, with activation as well, isn't it? But um, there's other elements too. So yeah, that's great. Thank you. And then we've got. Um, so yeah, from Shukra, um, incorporating multiple long-term conditions into medical education undergraduate level to provide a kind of sensitization and awareness of the issues. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's been a real, um, there's been a, you know, that's been a really vital point, but thanks Shukra. So um, yeah, absolutely. And equipping really tomorrow's doctors um, in managing multiple long-term conditions, kind of encouraging that, that kind of holistic way of thinking from an undergraduate level, isn't it, is, is, very important and probably doesn't really happen enough at this point in time, but I think there is a real drive to for that to be, for that to change. Um, so yeah, I think that's a real, real key element, isn't it? So I'm gonna pop that in there. Um, Thank you. Um, and so from Amrit, we've got um, economics of multiple long-term conditions. So that could include economic burden as well as economic evaluation of interventions. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, absolutely. So that's perhaps actually that's something that we don't we don't think about that often, isn't it? But um, yeah, absolutely. So uh, as part of the treatment burden, we've got the medication, but also um, all the other implications of that, attending hospital appointments, um, you know, all of the other sort of impact on um, the ability to work and loads of other things um, that perhaps we don't don't think about, but you know, is we really should be thinking about. So yeah, an economic perspective. Thanks, Thank you. So, um, and then we have um, Courtney. Thanks, Courtney. So, uh, education for relatives and carers. Absolutely. So, I would definitely agree with that. And, and so, for Margaret, from the um, undergraduate perspective, the role of early diagnosis. Um, absolutely. So, um, kind of recognizing and um, recognizing the kind of early onset kind of the you know multimorbidity also multiple long-term conditions sorry kind of recognizing that you know um and frailty as well as a concept that's closely linked isn't it so kind of recognizing those elements early on so yeah so Um, and so from Ashcon, we've got under an umbrella term, I would also consider um, clinical and humanistic outcomes, such as quality of life, patient knowledge, medication adherence, knowledge of medications, et cetera, for humanistic outcomes. And um, so 
absolutely. So is that something, um, perhaps should I pop that on the research board um, that we've got next Ashcon, where we, um, when we think about kind of the outcomes that we look at when we, you know, in our interventions and research that we carry out into multiple long-term conditions to look beyond the purely clinical outcomes. And as you put it, the humanistic outcomes. Would you agree? Yeah, thanks, Ashcon. Okay, so thanks so much, everybody. That was really that was really great. So um, I'm going to pop Ashcon's point here, and then we can. So. Let's see. Thank you. So, so we spare. Um, so, thanks so much for all your contributions. That's been really great. Uh, I think we've got lots of interesting points there. Um, is there anything anyone else, would, anyone, anyone would like to raise about um, future directions from a, an education perspective, multiple long-term conditions? Um, I would, Harini, if you can yeah, hear sure. me. Yeah. Um, just going along, really, uh, with your polypharmacy one that you'd you'd added. Um, yeah. Obviously as people get more frail and uh, time goes by and more conditions are added polypharmacy um you know as as time goes by we will need to start to remove some of those medications that have been added and try and simplify regimes or um remove the more harmful side effect you know anything with more harmful side effects or potentially um, especially in diabetes, think drugs that may cause hyperglycemia as people get more frail, things like that. So maybe deprescribing is a yeah an educational need as well. Yeah, absolutely. That goes along with that. Deprescribing, absolutely. So yeah, absolutely. I think so. Enabling clinicians in you know kind of have in kind of how to approach it and yeah absolutely and reducing that treatment burden isn't it deep yeah yeah burden. yeah absolutely I, I i would agree with you there i think that's a real um that is an area isn't it but both from a research and also education perspective um needs a lot of focus and i think would be really useful um from a clinician's perspective absolutely so yeah thank you for raising that Absolutely. So, yeah, thanks, everybody. That's that, that was great. Thank you. We've got lots of interesting points there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what, what we'll do actually is um, I, what we could do is we could just do we could take screenshots of these um, and then either, um, you know, we'll be able to either share them on our on, on Twitter or um, email them around or something like that. With screenshots of these boards so that anybody wants to look back and think about what points were raised, we can do that. And it's also really useful for us who've organised the event to have a think about the future. Thank you. So, um, so the next thing really um, on a broader perspective, um, and just want to think about future directions for research, I suppose. So um, obviously we've had um, quite a lot of research focused talks over the past, kind of over the course of this series um, as part of that. So one of the ones that um, I know that a couple of points have come up, we've, we've already added here um, through the course of our discussions. So um, approaching, yeah, as we talked about with Shukrat, preventing fragmentation and integrating services. Um, considering outcomes beyond just clinical outcomes and one I've added here is, is about kind of consultation models to improve efficiency um, from a clinician's perspective or from a GP perspective and um, so um, from Courtney here we've got um, interplay of different conditions and the management of each one and how decisions are made and conflicting advice between conditions yeah absolutely Courtney so this is a, this is a really pertinent one isn't it so I mean, really that's kind of the crux of the difficulty that we have um, from a clinical perspective in, in our in everyday clinical practice in managing patients with multiple long-term conditions. So yeah, absolutely. Some research and solutions to this would be would be great. I'm going to put that into play.
Correct, absolutely. And as we know, there's a lot of adverse outcomes that come about as a result of conflicting advice, isn't it? So we've got polypharmacy and, um, you know, kind of the, the increased treatment burden and uh, increased risk of adverse drug events and multiple things. So yeah, absolutely a really pertinent area. So we've got a um, comment from Zara there as well. Um, into the psychological impact of living with and managing multiple long-term conditions for both patients and carers. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, totally. I'm going to pop that on there as well. So, absolutely and yeah psychological I'm going to add there and social impact perhaps as well or perhaps that should be a separate point actually and um, it's it kind of get tied together but also it's very important in their own I'm going to add that in there as well social impact too. great and so from, so from uh, Margaret, we've got an um, understanding, um, yeah, understanding of efficient PPI with considerations for each condition. Absolutely. So the importance of PPIE engagement. Um, yeah, absolutely. And the kind of the understanding of the lived experience and the treatment burden and everything, isn't it? Um, absolutely. I think that would, that's, that's vitally important. Thank you. So from Risa, from um, Ashcon, we've got there. So con conducting or collaborating with individuals or companies who conduct observational studies uh, to generate real world data for new or repurposed medications. So uh, for none, for none of them known, I can't, can't say that at all, for CKD and type 2 diabetes. So yeah, so um, I'm trying to think if I had to summarize that. So kind of collaborating across, collaborating with them, um, company, yeah, well, I'm just going to put that in there, the beta mash one. Great, thank you. Fab, thanks very much. And then, um, yes, yeah, some other medications that Margaret suggested as well. I should pop that in the EG section. Great, thank you very much. So lots and lots of points there raised. Um, anything else that anyone would like to contribute to the board? I mean, I think I put a comment around um, identifying which comorbidities cluster together with diabetes. Um, okay, right. sure. Yeah, 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 absolutely, Claire. So, so identifying, sorry, for some reason my curse is not there. <laughs> technological difficulty so identifying um, which comorbidities cluster together diabetes um, I think as a separate that yeah absolutely Claire and as a separate point to that as well I think um, kind of understanding that um, the kind of understanding of um, clusters of multimorbidities isn't it how um, kind of thinking beyond um, you know, within multiple long-term conditions, um, 
how particular clusters, the impact of that, um, with groups of conditions that occur, kind of coexist commonly together. I think that would be, um, yeah. That would, yeah, so. Great. Thank you. So um, I think I haven't, I think that's everyone's points there, isn't it? Is there anything else that anyone would like to raise future directions wise for research? So yeah, Courtney says, um, so we have a paper on comorbidity clusters and CKD under review at the moment, hopefully published soon. That's great. Thank you, Claire. This, thank you, Courtney, even. Sorry. So yeah, that's another one, isn't it? So CKD is so common um, and linked to actually so many other the chronic conditions so I think it would be really interesting and useful to kind of understand to understand that really kind of think more about more about conditions in groups absolutely thank you so um we've got one last board um so we've got we've got about 10 minutes so perhaps we could just you know in a similar way um so, you know, we just to kind of, if anybody would like to, the next thing to think about really is how we, um, tips for successful implementation into clinical practice. So what would make things easier um, to bring kind of the research evidence, uh, you know, what would help to bring things into clinical practice? What would make things more efficient or more likely to be successful? Um, so, um, yeah, so once again, oh, we've got a comment from Margaret here. I think the comment earlier is that their condition, um, not yours. Thank you, Margaret. And um, oh, sorry, I've, I've missed a comment here from Shukra as well. Research into interventions and tools to improve self-management. Thanks, Shukra. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pop that in there. So it's um, and with Margaret. So um, I presume you, so a seat to the table for all in the design of research absolutely so it's is as um you know as as fiona was saying earlier it's um when, when considered considered from a diabetes perspective it's this idea of it's it's the patient's diabetes not not yours as the clinicians isn't it so absolutely so so vital to get the the ppi the you know the ppi engagement and the kind of lived ex the, you know the the patient's lived experience so that in there so I'm gonna, pop that in there. I'm gonna quote you verbatim there well I'm gonna um, pop that in there verbatim Margaret because I think that encapsulates it really well see at the table for all in the design of research yeah I think that's a really really nice way of popping that thank you very much so I put that on the um, comment there so so yeah, so very last board really. So for the last few minutes, that just to quickly consider, um, what would make things easier? What would make, um, you know, what would make interventions more likely to be successful in being implemented into clinical practice? Um, and so again, um, in a similar way, I'd like to invite everybody to share any thoughts that they might have. So yeah, that's what I've put here. Um, PPI engagement. So actually, yeah. So um, like we've just been talking about, um, is kind of understanding, you know, kind of kind of bearing in mind who, you know, what. The purpose of what why why we're doing things we want to improve patient experience um and so really um the key i feel uh, um you know for kind of successful implementation is to kind of engage as as margaret's put um you know everybody who's in, involved in the design you know it, in, involved or everybody who's affected um in the design of research and most importantly um patients because really they're at the center of center of our aims that's what I've shared there. So um, anybody else who'd like to, any other tips or anything anybody can think of? <laughs> I guess it starts with um, successful dissemination, but um, yeah. to make sure we're, we're sharing our results well, widely, which, um, Sometimes we're not very good at really. We share them amongst ourselves and forget yeah. to share them with patients and clinicians. 
absolutely. So it's it's sort of um, dissemination um, in accessible dissemination, I suppose, isn't it? So where uh, am I right? In, what what do you think is that the kind of correct phrase? The widely accessible. So it's um, it's yeah. So things get published in journals and kind of seen by academics, but whether they um, kind of kind of sharing sharing things beyond that and yeah. um yeah absolutely so yeah widely accessible dissemination and pop in there um and from courtney we've got a comment there understand current services and how how many fit in absolutely so that's the thing isn't it is how the thing the intervention being designed how that will fit into existing practices and existing services um yeah, no, I, I understood. Thanks, Courtney. <laughs> so, absolutely. So, I think this is where, um, kind of thinking back to seat at the table for all in the design or research is um, the importance of involving us clinicians as well, um, or um, in, a clin in, in, in kind of getting that feedback, getting that sort of ideas for how, you know, how, how things will fit, fit in best into, into their everyday clinical practice and into processes that are already in place. So from Margaret, we've got um, feedback to people involved in research. Absolutely. So, yeah, so again, it's sort of, yeah, so we're kind of feeding back to participants, feeding back to and those who've been involved in PPI engagement. It's easily missed, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you. So we've, we've just got about five minutes. There. So uh, anything else that anyone would like to share on tips for better inclusivity? So we've got a comment from Shukrat there. Better inclusivity, a wide range. Yeah, so. So more. In, so. Um, on there. to research. Okay. Thanks, sure for that. So I'll put that in there. Better inclusivity. Absolutely. So I think it's kind of the the point that we keep coming back to is how important it is to um from the from the design stage to kind of to think about those practical elements, isn't it? And to see how and how things would fit in um, into real life clinical practice, but also how, how they would be received by, by patients themselves, who ultimately that's the aim of um, aim of everything that we do. Thank you, thanks everybody. So um, is there anything else that anyone would like to raise? Any other any other points or comments? And um, and thanks so much for everything um, or you know all your contributions so far. That's been great. So we've got lots of points here from for all these different topics. So, like I said, what we'll do is um, I'll save these and then we'll share them, um, hopefully on the Twitter platform, um, and perhaps we can send those screenshots around as well um, when we share the slides at the end. So, thanks very much. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen there. Unless there's anything else, any of the last points that anyone wants to raise? No. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. So yeah, thanks everybody for your time and thanks for coming along. Um, so this is the end of the um, our series, really. So um, so stay tuned. I'm sure we'll come back for um, for more for more series like these in the future. So thanks very much for, for all your time. Thank you. Thank you for organising it all. Thank you. Thanks very much. So have a good good sunny afternoon, everyone.